our procedure is going to be is they, starting, starting with Brian um, and Zan and then Matt, um, they will introduce themselves and say something about where they locate themselves in this conversation. And then I have a question for each of them, and then um, we have a chance for you to enter into the conversation with some questions as well. Okay, Brian. Great. Well, Bishop Mark, thank you for having us here and convening this conversation. Um, I'm Brian Bellendorf. I work for the Linux Foundation, which is a consortium of over 2,000 different companies building lots of different technologies, not just the Linux operating system, but uh, almost 1,000 other open source software projects, including quite a few in the AI domain. Uh, and some of these technologies are the bedrock technologies for the development of modern uh, LLMs, the large language models. Um, uh, uh, and, and earlier iterations of AI. Uh, I lead AI strategy as well as do some other things at the organization. Um, I can't possibly hope to represent the entirety of the industry uh, or uh, what all technologists believe or view around AI. Um, but one of the um, defining epistemological kind of uh, debates out there are between um, uh, people, very smart people on, on all parts of the spectrum, some who believe we should put the pedal to the metal and go as fast down whatever course we're going to go down when it comes to developing these technologies uh, so that we can digest it as a society as we have with previous technologies, almost every one of which has been dangerous, and get to a point where we can maximize the good uh, and solve some really critical issues. There's a lot of optimism about using AI to solve uh, deep pro environmental issues, uh, deep, deep uh, healthcare issues, uh, a lot of optimism about that, but with some concurrent risk about, uh, that we'll have to figure out how to deal with. There are others who want to take a much more cautious approach to this, who compare it to nuclear technology or to bioterrorism and say, um, we have to be very careful about who knows this information about how we deploy this uh, so that uh, the bad people are, you know, are limited in, in doing the bad things with the technology. Um, now, I've built my career in open source software. Um, I, that helped build the internet. That helped build uh, a lot of the technologies we depend upon today. It's 70 to 90 percent of the software inside your phone, inside your car, sitting inside an app behind a website. And this community, for 30 years that it's called itself this term, has believed in sharing information, sharing knowledge, sharing source code as a means to move society forward. And in some ways, it's even inherited a tradition deep in the computer field and the informatics field that I would point to Douglas Engelbart in the 1960s. Um, uh, if you go and Google the mother of all demos, you'll see him demoing in 1968, uh, based on his research at Xerox PARC, um, a windowing environment, the mouse, hypertext, a lot of the things that we take for granted today. And Douglas Engelbart really had this vision of information technology as a way to augment humanity, as a way to augment individual power, but also collective power. Um, that I, I, it could make us extend our humanity in new ways, in new fields. And, and really, the, the fruits of that should be very widely shared. And it was such a compelling vision that it inspired a young Steve Jobs to steal every one of those ideas from the other all demos and, uh, uh, and work them into Apple's first generation of products. Um, uh, and that, but that vision of, of human augmentation right, I, 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 is one that certainly carries some risk. You know? I, but the, the path that I take through this based on the experience that we've had with open source software has been um, not quite like let's put the pedal to the metal and go as fast as we can, but to recognize that power corrupts, right? Uh, that concentration of technology power tends to lead to a weaker society overall. Maybe this was more relevant 25 years ago when one company based in Redmond owned 95% of the, of the world's desktops. Um, but I think we were able to build a different technology industry by collective action and sharing knowledge widely. Um, and when it comes to AI, managing, making sure we can maximize the good, making sure we can really work together to mitigate the harms, to work together on those harms, tools that might mitigate those harms, would really benefit from an open source software approach. Um, but this is a live debate in this community. There are strong voices in all uh, segments of it, and the policymakers are listening. Uh, the technologists building this are thinking, how do I build guardrails and safety into the tools themselves? So I'm really eager to, to explore that over the next hour. Thank you so much. Zan. I'm 
I'm Zan Gill, and I was going to just say a little bit about how I started. So when I was a graduate student at Harvard studying architecture, I realized that I wasn't interested in designing buildings. But the big aha for me was I said, I am really glad that I am in this program because this is such systematic training in synthesis, which we need for complex systems problem solving. And problems like climate change, uh, saving the ocean, uh, ending war. And uh, so back then, I had the opportunity to uh, study with and then work with uh, Buckminster Fuller, who had conceived the concept of world game, which really uh, anticipated, this was pre-internet, but he anticipated and really required the public internet to um, implement this big concept. And so then later, we had the public internet, and I was working at NASA, and I said, aha, we can finally begin to conceive how we would develop a global sustainability collaboratory. And based on what I call collaborative intelligence, which is really inspired by nature's uh, evolutionary, prodigious creativity, and, and the way that thriving, not only the way evolution operates, but the way that thriving ecosystems operate. And so then very soon after that, I realized that what I was envisioning I needed to do outside of any government agency or particular country. And so I started EarthDEX, where the acronym DEX stands for Distributed Evolving Collaborative Knowledge System. And so that's part of why I'm so interested in what is going on with the open source AI uh, community because they exemplify a distributed evolving collaborative knowledge system, you know, rapidly evolving, it's a it's model of natural evolution without top-down control. There are lots of attempts to control it, right? And that's a tussle that is going on. But uh, there, I see great uh, potential for optimism in what's going on in the open source community toward addressing, of course, the great threats that, that we face. And I would just say the, the last aha for me, uh, and I should, it should qualify this to say that what I am advocating really counters some of our assumptions and prevailing paradigms. And I'll just give one simple one. The assumption that problem solving should start with consensus seeking and goal setting. Well, nature never convenes a committee to decide what to evolve next. And if we're really translating that evolutionary model, then the power of that model is that innovation is emergent, as in the open source community. And so, but for me, the last aha was to say, wait a minute, I have been focusing on collaborative intelligence for complex systems problem solving, which is kind of a big mouthful for all of us. And what we, the other piece that we need is storytelling, because storytelling harnesses our subjective views. Storytelling is a vehicle toward equity, which taps everybody as opposed to the correct narrative, which we all know if we look carefully, the correct narrative is defined by those in power. Um, and so what we need is to move beyond that to to honor our various experiences and points of view. Wonderful, thank you. Matthew. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Wonderful to be in this dialogue, such an important topic. Um, I'm Matt Siegel, I'm a philosopher and a associate professor at California Institute of Integral Studies um, in a program that's called Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness. A very interdisciplinary program even transdisciplinary. Um, I like to think of myself as a pretty disciplined thinker, but I'm also undisciplined in the sense that um, I like to collaborate with scientists and artists and theologians and um, a monk one time. And so I'm really all over the place. And I like to think across boundaries to transgress disciplinary boundaries uh, because, you know, in the modern and, and postmodern 
um, university, all of these disciplines became very fragmented. And nobody was given the job of trying to glue it all back together again. And I wasn't asked, but I've taken up that, that job. Um, and there are many transdisciplinary thinkers that I draw on to try to, to do this, um, this feat, which um, I'll be doing for the rest of my life. So consciousness, I think, is a, a subject that often comes up in, in conversations about artificial intelligence. And the first thing I would want to make clear is that consciousness, our own thinking, our feeling, our willing, is not an information processing uh, sort of thing. It's um, something that is, our consciousness is invisible. It doesn't show up anywhere in the physical world in a way that natural science could measure, right? We can measure the effects of consciousness. We can measure the behavior in the brain and changes in um, synapses and neurochemistry and everything. But we can't actually see consciousness. We can't weigh consciousness. We can't measure it. Information is a way of, of measuring the world. And a digital computer can do all sorts of things to mimic uh, human language, to mimic human behavior in all sorts of ways. But that doesn't mean that it's conscious. As good as it might become at mimicking us, it doesn't mean that it has the sort of creative thinking capacities, feeling capacities, and willing capacities that human beings have. Now, all that said, um, if we shift our focus on will we be able to make conscious machines towards well, how are these machines going to be changing our consciousness, augmenting our consciousness? Now, that's a very interesting and important conversation to have. Um, artificial intelligence makes it sound like there was some kind of natural intelligence before that. Human intelligence, in some way, has always been artificial. And what do I mean by that? Well, think about the relationship between our own intelligence, our thinking capacity, and language even just oral language. We're externalizing something. We're hearing ourselves speaking, and that's augmenting our own innate thinking capacity. And then we start writing, and then we get alphabets, and then we get all of these new media technologies over the last century or so, radio, television, the internet, artificial intelligence in the sense of uh, large language models and video generation and image generation. Our consciousness has been in dialogue with evolving alongside these technologies all the way along. So our intelligence has always been artificial in that sense, right? And But the question I would raise, which is an ethical one, but also an ex existential one about just what it even means to be human, is to what extent are we augmenting our intelligence and our consciousness? And to what extent might we be amputating it? Which is to say, we're giving the machines more and more uh, of the tasks that we used to do internally and less and less of what it used to mean to be human is, is, is done by human beings. We're automating so much of our lives. And you know, sometimes I think, wouldn't it be nice to have a robot to make my, my breakfast for me so I could you know, just enjoy my coffee and read every morning for another hour. Um, but cooking is enjoyable. And interacting with the, with the world, with food, it's, it's part of what makes us who and what we are. And so I think we would want to be careful about the extent to which augmentation because becomes amputation. Yeah, I'll stop there, and, and we'll see where the conversation goes. OK. Well, I'm going to, since I'm facing you now, yeah. I'll start in reverse order with you, Matthew. Um, the, um, as you know, I do a lot of work in climate change and environment. And uh, Amitav Ghosh has written a fantastic book that traces the 400-year development of the problem um, that, that we label climate change and environmental degradation. And it starts with human behavior uh, and really the disposition of the human heart, if you will. Um, and it's a process of um, objectifying other people, uh, other species, and the planet itself. So um, as Thomas Berry uh, famously said, it would be our desire to be a communion of subjects rather than a collection of objects. And I think that's right, but not quite right, because there's always a few subjects, and they are in relation to a, a great number of objects. 
which are resources for us, and they can be used. So this is related to what I was mentioning to you before the panel began, which is um, the dignity of consciousness, if you will, mm -hmm. the, the recognition of subjectivity in others that we deny to them for our convenience, for, for the purposes, if you will, of extraction. You've done a great deal of work on consciousness, and um, I wonder if you could comment uh, at, on this idea of um, subjectivity and its, the status that consciousness grants to, to the subject, the, the status of subject rather than object, um, related to the idea that consciousness is much more widely distributed than we think, including the food that you prepare, that you take pleasure in. In, a, in one um, model of the world, that food too has subjectivity mm -hmm. and, and, um, and perhaps consciousness. So I, I yeah. wonder, wonder if that uh, is something you could comment on. Um, one of my favorite philosophers, Alfred North Whitehead, he says that uh, life is robbery in the sense that life needs to eat other life. But he says the robber needs justification, right? And so um, subjectivity or consciousness is this, this interior capacity and this um, sense of the world, uh, of a horizon of experience. And I'm more or less what's called a panpsychist. And there, there are three or four major metaphysical positions that are on offer in philosophy. There might be more if you want to you know, bring a, a sharper knife here, but there's basically materialism, idealism, dualism, and panpsychism, right? Materialism, everyone pretty much knows what that means. There's really no such thing as mind. It's just the way that matter behaves when it gets really complicated. Um, idealism would be the reverse of that. Really, there's only mind, and matter is kind of an appearance in this one mind. And dualism would be, well, there's both mind and matter. We're not sure how they relate, but you can't reduce one to the other. Panpsychism is the view that the physical world is perfectly real, mind is perfectly real, and mind is, is the way that matter expresses itself. And matter is sort of, you could call it the outside of mind. They're not two separate types of stuff. They're just two ways of looking at the same activity. And so, Everything I just said before about how machines, uh, digital computers, information processing devices of various kinds are not conscious is I, something I would have to qualify a little bit as a panpsychist because on some level, electrons, um, all forms of, of, ac of, of physical activity, I would say have an interior dimension to them, right? Um, human consciousness is a very refined, evolved form of this experiential capacity that's very basic when we're talking about electrons. Um, but nonetheless, there's some interiority there. So every little grain of dust has some ethical standing, in my view, yes. right? Um, every blade of grass is a living being. And you know we don't think of that. And we can't think of the ethical status of each blade of grass when we're walking through a meadow. We would be too overwhelmed by it. And so, you know, human beings care about other human beings. We try to care about human beings who are not just our family members, not just our friends, not just people who belong to our community or nation. We expand our circles of ethical concern. More and more human beings are now looking at the animal world and saying, hey, wait a minute, should I be eating this species of animal, this, this cow? Um, you know, other countries eat dogs. We think that's horrible. And in India, they think eating cows is, is horrible. And so our ethical circles can expand. And when it comes to the possibility of machine consciousness, I think the real interesting area here ethically is to think about how human beings are going to begin to um, become more and more inseparable from their machines. We already have you know, our smartphones in our pockets all the time. Neuralink and other companies are putting chips in the brain that's a trajectory of evolution that I suspect will continue. And you know, at what point does a human being become as machine as they are human or biological? And then you know, that, 
that becomes a, a real ethical quandary. And I'm inclined to say, well, you know, there's a real ethical subject there that needs to be treated with dignity and respect. And so even though I don't think large language models or um, the sorts of approaches to artificial general intelligence that are currently on offer will ever lead to consciousness, I think there are other forms of human machine interfaces that will raise those sorts of questions and that we do need to rethink who counts as, a, as a, another ethical subject. Yeah. I love that. Um, the, the walking across the meadow and relating to the blades of grass, I, I think you know, you're quite right that it's impossible for us to think our way through, but we could have a posture mm. of reverence. Mm -hmm. And I think that is also what you're pointing to, is that yeah. our stance as we walk across the meadow as a reverent person is a, a recognition of the life standing of that, of all the life that's um, implicated as we walk across, uh, across that. And of course, there are many cultures that have, in the face of enormous difficulties, maintained that relationship of reverence to, uh, to other than themselves. Mm -hmm. And maybe would even say they don't recognize the other than themselves, the, the entwined right. nature of it. Um, yeah, so thank, thank you, Matthew. And we'll be returning, right? So, Zan, um, we were talking about art responses, and I've been reading a lot in the science fiction and the speculative fiction area about, let's just say, cyborgs, meaning cybernetic, organic connections. The, the, uh, and it's usually seen as one thing, one being, uh, a robot that has organic components. You've been working for a very long time with DEX, with, the, with this really, um, I, I think, more advanced idea uh, that it's a community, a, a evolving community of um, inorganic, organic life. Uh, so I've, I've recently, uh, as I mentioned to you before, um, become aware that um, some of the largest companies working with AI present their products, their AI products, as having been um, pristinely produced by, by the array of computers that, that they use. Mm -hmm. And uh, these articles point out that that's never been the case, that there are uh, copy editors and, and humans who are brought in to complete the product. And they're not credited, usually. So there's, there's some ethical questions there. I see them as rather like um, adjunct faculty at our great universities who are not given benefits, uh, who are paid uh, small amounts. And, but the, the university is presented as you know, this complete, finished, ethical, marvelous thing. And it's got a, you know, an underbelly that's not, not quite right. But if we look at it openly and see that it is a community, not just a single robot, but a community of people and a community, if you will, of, um, of computers in relation to each other. What is that and what, what is the potential um, for that and also the ethical problems with that? Fascinating. I, I would like to start by looking at the debate around the definition of the singularity. Uh -huh. And um, most of us assume that the singularity is the moment when computers exceed human intelligence, because Ray Kurzweil wrote his big book in 2005, and that was his definition of the singularity. It got a lot of promotion and marketing. But for me, the really fascinating thing is to go back to where he got that idea from Werner Vinge, a mathematician whose classic, he wrote two papers actually, one in 1983, and, but the one, the really classic one in 1993, which he presented at NASA, entitled The Singularity. And Werner Vinge had four definitions of the singularity. And so what is fascinating to me, because I'm really interested in the potential of AI and humans in the loop 
right? And that deals with a lot of the ethical issues because it's not the conventional paradigm where you pre-train the AI and then you send it out to execute and then it makes all sorts of mistakes and you pull it back and you train it some more. It's a continual feedback loop with, with humans in the loop. And so I actually met with Werner Vinge because I wanted to know if he thought that Ray Kurzweil had misrepresented him. And I knew he wouldn't tell me that in an email. And so he's also a science fiction writer, by the way, as well as a mathematician. And indeed, he did feel that he was misrepresented because of his four definitions of the singularity, one of them is the one that Ray Kurzweil picked up the, the most shocking one that would get the most news. And then the second one and the third one are two different ways to engage humans with AI to create this super intelligence. And that's much more difficult, actually, to imagine. That's really relates to the open source community as well. And then the fourth one had to do with augmentation of human intelligence. And so I think we have a very interesting prospect, and you want me to get to the, the potential of science fiction in all of this. I am using science fiction in a particular way because I'm interested in social change, but I'm interested in social change that doesn't kind of preach, right? And so the genre that I see my science fiction books as falling into is what I call FAQ punk. And FAQ was coined by Eugene Mia at NASA, and it was originally for the, the science um, uh, Usenet, right? For the, the people interested in NASA issues. Um, and, and it was for frequently asked questions, right? And then that got picked up and was generally used for instructions. You know, here's the FAQ on this and the FAQ on that. And, but what I'm intrigued by is the question of how we, fact punk, FAQ punk, I should say, is, is really saying, what if we can use science fiction to raise questions that really need to be raised, where we don't want to be saying, this is correct or that is correct. We want to hear lots of debate on these issues, right? And then punk, of course, there is uh, cyberpunk, which is considered generally uh, dystopian, and now there is solar punk, which is considered utopian. But I think taking one of those positions is not as creative as saying, wait a minute, a fiction can ask a lot of questions, can raise a lot of questions, and can start to be interactive with its audience so that it goes, you know, you have fiction in action, actually fiction, fiction connected to social change. Yeah, and it, it, it worms its way into our consciousness a lot more effectively than um, uh, didactic preaching, right. doesn't it? Um, and, and which uh, I assume has led you to your um, focus on narrative. Well, um, I, my focus on narrative really, I, I had a long-term interest, and so I was writing screenplays even while I was working at, well, actually before I was working at NASA. Uh, but I really had two sides to my life, and the, the screenplay fiction side was secret, mm -hmm. and I just sort of wasn't ready to go public with that because I thought it would damage my credibility right. as a NASA scientist. As it would. And then I realized I was really quite frustrated mm -hmm. with uh, my lack of effectiveness, mm -hmm. I should say, as a NASA scientist trying to push this collaborative intelligence barrel yeah. uphill. And I said, wow, there is potential. I'm, I'm going to go live with all this fiction stuff yes. that I've been working on and uh, use that to try to stimulate uh, the conversations that we need to be having. Yeah. Yeah. And it is more stimulating. I think uh, it's a, but, but we've been encouraged to keep these two, two parts of ourselves apart. Well, we? I should say the really important kind of theoretical point here is that I think we have a big problem in this society with the notion that there is a correct narrative and our educational system should 
teach the correct information. And of course, now this has really degenerated into a kind of a power play between this is correct and this is misinformation and in a lot of censorship and real problems with free speech. And so my, my interest in this is the notion that we need to get to a society that allows multiple points of view right. on the table and that teaches critical thinking because we're, we're so worried that, you know, AI is going to give us hallucination and false information. Well, we're getting that from humans yeah. as well. And we need to, to learn to read multiple points of view and then to decide. And we need access to multiple points of view. Yeah, well, that leads uh, to uh, a question for you, Brian. And, and that um, has to do with the, the people putting the pedal to the metal. As, we, as, as you spoke, um, there, there are people driving this. And um, very recently, a commentator uh, said that the uh, Russian techniques of misinformation that uh, they are, have been attempting to use to manipulate uh, our elections, that these are crude techniques that have been around uh, in, in the Soviet Union, then Russia, for decades. But once they have the AI tools, uh, it's exponential uh, what they can do uh, with that. And, and we know that AI can lie. Um, that, that, that's potential too. Um, what I raised with you before we began talking, um, when the open AI uh, governance de debacle took place last fall, um, a New York Times, uh, sorry, a New Yorker commentator said, this is actually a corporate governance problem. Uh, so if we, if we look at the technology itself, that has problematic aspects. It, AI can lie. It, it amplifies the ability to disseminate misinformation, but it's the people using it, uh, e either in this corporate governance question or in the propagation of misinformation, where the real ethical problems uh, are. And I wonder, from, from within the industry, if you could s comment on how does um, how does how do we confront that? How do, how does the industry police itself? How, do, um, if you will, and how do we interact with that in a in a way that is uh, not punitive or blaming, but because it, it's we're making these choices as well. We the, the yeah. culture. Yeah. Well, um, speaking from the supply side, there's a supply yeah. side to that answer and a demand side to yes. that answer. Um, uh, one thing that we've lacked generally in the uh, technology field, the information technology field, is the equivalent of a Hippocratic Oath in medicine, right? right. Lots of developers have, and, and product managers and CEOs have different worldviews um, and, and philosophies about what, what the ideal looks like. You know, Elon Musk has one. It's probably very different from, from a lot of other people, right? Um, uh, and, and I think there was also a generation of us, uh, and I'll count myself in that generation, who were raised on Isaac Asimov, you know, to go back to talk about, you know, uh, sci-fi just forbidden narrative, but raised in particular, and uh, came of age in our 20s, in that window of time between the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Twin Towers, where it was possible and credible and coherent to simultaneously be a fan of getting more interconnected, that there's a basic goodness to humanity, and if we could wire our brains up, you know, if we can uh, you know, make it easier to perform collective action, tremendously positive things would happen, more than just not needing the yellow pages anymore. Does anyone remember the yellow pages? Like, we don't need that anymore, or not, we don't need a map anymore to know where we're going, right? Um, I mean, the world is so different, and we kind of forget how much better it is now than then. Um, but that window of time was, it was okay to be an idealist. And it's awfully hard to be an idealist in the last 20 years, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, we've certainly been challenged by what we've seen has been this asymmetric use of technology by bad actors to, to, to have have some pretty harmful effects. I think we've still seen, you know, like misinformation has been a problem since the earliest days of spam on the internet. And we developed tools to help us filter spam to one direction or another so that we are, our email <laughs> is usable still, right? Um, the ability to detect fakes, you know, deep fakes, so to speak, uh, to fight misuse of that technology, certainly. 
there are emerging techniques to do this. Today, there's, um, for example, uh, 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 a certain set of cameras from Sony and from Leica. When they take a photo of a thing, they'll embed a signature in that photo uh, that's, that, that allows you to know that was actually the photo as taken by that hardware sensor. That was not a photo that was altered or manufactured uh, through an AI or anything else. It was the original photo. Um, and those are being enhanced and then add signatures by the photographer and other things. But, but one way to counter deep fakes is to reestablish and, and build better support mechanisms than we've had on the internet for establishing trust, you know, to, to understand when we see an image or, or we, we read something, what is the source of that information? And we've been derelict on that on the internet as, as technologists because we've kind of benefited from this surplus of trust, this deep reservoir of trust that sadly has been drained by, by the bad actors out there, right? So we have to figure out how to, how to replenish that. And so on the supply side, you do see uh, uh, technologists asking, how do we build these things in such a way that they minimize harm, the potential for harm? Uh, I do think somebody who invents a thing is, has a different moral frame than somebody who deploys that thing mm -hmm. into action. Um, a lot of the, well, you, you know, OpenAI, for example. Could you say a little about that difference? Yeah, so um, the company OpenAI, right, which has a nonprofit shell around it that is originally intended to be started as a nonprofit, mm -hmm. and, and gradually that mission has kind of eroded, uh, and as its, its theory of change has been to roll out commercial services based on the AI technology they've developed. So uh, uh, we can talk more about the New Yorker article and that governance challenge in a bit if we'd like. Um, but uh, I, I, there, that, was, that was their theory of change. They put it into production. Today, you can go and for $20 a month, actually for free, you can go and start chatting with ChatGPT and, and get value out of it, right? That's deploying it. And so if that instance of it generates really ugly content, it's kind of on them, right? Um, upstream from that, a lot of people who work on open source software work on the bits behind the scenes, right? They work and they share that stuff, but it, there's a pivot point between working on that underlying technology and when it gets deployed. And that pivot point is where it's appropriate for companies to, to, to realize when they put it into production, they've got all sorts of, of uh, uh, obligations to their users to, to, to minimize harm, to avoid misleading use of it, to, to implement a terms of service, that sort of thing. And so uh, but what we're finding is even upstream, a lot of people want to figure out how do we make it easier possible, the default for the stuff when it's deployed to be more safely consumed. So, so that's the supply side of the picture. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing this emergent trend by many in the industry to go, how do we implement these in a, in a way that doesn't, you know, is more of a carrot than a stick, right? Is more of a, here's how it's easier mm -hmm. to be uh, uh, beneficent. Here's how it's easier to address bias and, and harms. Uh, I can actually talk quite a bit about some of the technical underpinnings of that, if that's of interest. On the demand side, though, we are starting to see consumers become much more skeptical about technology, and that's a good thing, mm -hmm. right? Putting AI to the side for a second, there was a New York Times article yesterday about how GM, if you select, if you opt into their uh, app when you buy a GM car to be a safe driver, uh, it's something that it'll tell you, give you advice on how to drive more safely or let you earn rewards for buckling your seatbelt more often. I mean, kind of silly things like that. Turned out they were selling that data to LexisNexis. Uh, with your name attached to it, your identity attached to it, who then would sell that to insurance companies. So your existing insurance company, when, when you went to re-up, would see, are, do you accelerate unreasonably? Do you drive faster than the speed limit? Do you brake suddenly? Like, are you a good driver? And people were finding their insurance rates, uh, not only from their current insurers, uh, suddenly skyrocket, uh, but, but even when they would go out to market, sometimes they couldn't even get insurance because their, their report, which they had no idea was being shared, uh, uh, told potential insurers that they were a bad risk. So the, uh, consumers are starting to wake up to this. Uh, uh, I'm on the board of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which has been hammering on this for, for you know, its entire existence since it was founded in 1990. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there's a, definitely a sense that that reservoir of trust that the tech industry has had with consumers has been drained. The consumers are agitating for this in Europe with the GDPR and, also, and the AI Act and all sorts of other uh, legislation they've been passing. Um, they're seeing that themselves having to act somewhat as a bulwark to represent the interests of users. Even in the states here, we have a lot of public policymakers going, do we have to implement consumer safety regulations to fight on the side of consumers? And frankly, as we use these tools like ChatGPT, I think we're starting to realize 
they're not so much sentient as they are mirror image reflections of the world. I mean, I, I, I'm sure many of you know this, but these machines, they hoover up as much data as they can feed, right? In fact, some of the early models, one of the canonical data sets they were trained on were comments from Reddit. Right? And now, Reddit's a useful thing. I go there from time to time. But by and large, like, if, that's, if you had a toddler that was raised on nothing but Reddit comments, by the time they were 16, they'd probably be pretty, pretty foul-mouthed and, and have horrible biases as well. Right? We have to expect, I mean, these are mirror image reflections of society as expressed through these different websites that have been providing this data. Right? And we're going to find, I think, that um, a lot of the movement in this industry will be towards being more selective mm -hmm. about the training sets instead of going for how many terabytes and exabytes can we throw at a model to make it as big as possible. How do we be more selective about it? A lot of good research is going into uh, uh, making these domains, uh, making these training sets more uh, sourced from ethical sources uh, or, or uh, uh, curated in a certain way or more specific to certain domains. Uh, there's even an open source, uh, well, there's a, uh, an open source uh, LLM uh, called Latimer, uh, which is trained on the archives of uh, uh, a publication, partly trained on an archives of a publication um, from uh, the South that was a, 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 a African American, uh, Black American publication. Uh, I, so using their stories, using their, their, the, the, the tone of voice, using uh, those, those, uh, the narratives from, the, from, from, from this newspaper archives going back 60, 70 years, uh, to make sure that those viewpoints, those, uh, those additional sets of biases right, are, are actually uh, one of the uh, models that can be brought into a modern application. Um, we're going to see more, I think, ethical kind of considerations around what are these underlying training sets uh, that are used. And I hope the consumer side of that, the demand side, mm -hmm. will be uh, uh, that, that they want to see that. You know, whether that's through policy making and regulatory approaches, my hope is that we get as, at least as much of that through um, the marketplace. You know, people demanding uh, uh, models that look less like the ugliness of the world today and more like the kind of world that we want to build. That's a good hope. And I should be voicing that hope. <laughs> but I wonder. Um, the Hippocratic Oath idea translated into this area of technology. Uh, I'm really interested in that. And I, I want to go back again to the, the, the pedal, um, because pause is part of that, isn't it? Uh, the, the idea to, to take time uh, to be able to, to find the um, nuances of possibility and risk in what we have. And we have plenty of examples of it, uh, the FDA. Uh, and the Federal Reserve. Um, these are, uh, and they are related to the industry they're regulating, but they are not the industry they're regulating. What would a Hippocratic um, Oath look like in your view? And, and would a pause, a, a way to impose a pause or encourage a pause um, so that the ethics catches up, that gap between the ethics and the the onslaught of technological innovation. Well, the, 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 the first part of this question, the, the Hippocratic Oath, there's some parts that are very challenging. I can't recite the entire oath uh, here up on stage, but I know the first part is first do no harm, mm -hmm. right? With technology, especially if you're upstream of deployment, you have to accept the prospect of somebody using the tools you're working on for harm, right? So that hard and fast, I mean, perhaps if you, if you bind the product managers and the CEOs and everybody involved in that last mile in that same do no harm kind of approach, then you come up to the debate of what is harm, right? right. Is uh, something like Uber harmful and to who? It's certainly helpful to a lot of people for whom the, taxi, the world of taxi service and mm -hmm. relying on friends to give you rides was not enough, especially if you're disabled or uh, I, I, you know, at, a, at a place where you couldn't afford the, kind of the, the, the rates that ta the taxis would charge at the time. But it's certainly harmful from the point of view of you know, fostering this gig economy uh, world that, that has been very, very uh, challenging for the people who are drivers in, uh, for, for, for Uber, right, mm -hmm. uh, historically. And I, some of that is rectifying and some of it is public policy. But um, um, uh, this do no harm thing, even that first sentence is challenging. And I think we'll have to look at coming up with something new. Um, IEEE does have a code of conduct that they expect. This, it's the uh, um, Institute of Electrical Engineers, and I'm sorry, I forget the acronym, but IEEE, right, is the engineering consortium. But most people writing AI code are probably not IEEE members. Right. You know, that idea of institutions, the idea of capacity building, 
a lot of people in this domain are self-taught. They're, they're uh, atavists. They're, they're, they're um, kind of, they go uh, for it themselves. And, and I think that's a culture that perhaps could, could change. Mm -hmm. The second part of your question, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, what, just the pause? The pause, right. So um, one of the early convenings of technologists in the AI sector was around a document uh, that was put forth uh, that suggested, among other kind of potential things, perhaps we should all in the AI industry put a pause on deploying um, larger models until, until we figured out a lot of things, right? Um, and certainly it was a call for restraint that was well heated. Uh, but a lot of people brought up, you know, uh, first off, many of the people who signed it went immediately back and kept iterating and deploying their models, right? So uh, it felt very thin on the ground in terms of actual substance or support. Uh, the second thing was that, you know, uh, putting, pausing the work of good actors. You know, not that the world can be so cleanly divided between good and bad actors, but let's pretend there's a spectrum. Um, pause, uh, generally, the people who would follow a pause like that would be the people who focused and interested in benign uses, right, or countering harmful uses. Mm -hmm. The bad actors are not going to pause, right? right? Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and with everybody playing bit parts in this larger picture, it might be that no one person feels like they have either the agency or that they matter in you know, a pause, right? Um, so, so it just it, 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 didn't, it didn't get picked up. As soon as, I mean, it was news for about a day, and then everyone went back to doing what they did before. Mm -hmm. um, being thoughtful about this yes. is a longer term right. conversation that I have seen this industry pick up. Mm -hmm. And it's been forced upon them by policymakers yes. Yes. In, in, in many interesting ways. Um, uh, the White House published a rather extensive uh, gu guidance for implementing AI by industry, by, by, by government, and others. Uh, I, that, wasn't, that fell just short of a regulation, but you could see that regulation coming. Um, as can the people in the industry. Uh, but I think it's also, they're realizing they no longer have that reservoir of trust mm -hmm. to draw from. That when they put these things out there, the more, you know, when Google had their mistake uh, with Gemini of, of people uh, being able to generate images that, you know, show me a picture of the Apollo 11 crew and it generated a diverse crew because everyone wants to have diverse pictures and images, but it didn't have a concept of time, so it didn't realize that in, in the 1960s and 70s, the people who went up were white males. Um, uh, so that, that, was, that was an embarrassment for them, right? Um, so, so uh, us figuring out what is going to be ethical in this domain needs to be an ongoing conversation. It needs to be something that uh, we use technology to advance our, our guardrails, advance our uh, uh, ways of building safety into these tools, and, and, and deciding what training sets to use and what are ethical deployments. Because I think if you stop iterating, if you stop experimenting in this domain, you don't have the chance to figure out the solutions. Um, you, I've never seen in a technology domain everything stop while we figure this out. Right, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't need it. Uh, um, thank you, that, that was fantastic. Uh, I'm going to stay with that and move to you, Matthew, about, um, again, in the climate world where I spend most of my time, uh, we know that we have to ramp up ambition uh, before the end of 2030 to avoid the worst effects of uh, climate disaster through the end of the century and beyond. Um, and so we are really pressing to, to make rapid and massive change in moving away from fossil fuel production and to renewables. Uh, the phrase that the UN uses uh, for the fallout of that is just transition. So meaning uh, the people, which is almost everybody, who rely in some way on the fossil fuel industry, but those who more directly rely on it for their livelihood are the ones who will first, um, along with vulnerable populations to climate events, this group will be the ones who feel the brunt of that. So as people are being displaced in the labor force, uh, and it's hit the HR, uh, and the PR sections of, of companies heavily already, the, so, it, so the evidence shows. As a philosopher and an ethicist, how do we confront the just transition um, question for, for workers who will, are being displaced? Mm. Well, <clears throat> this technology that is clearly going to automate a lot of jobs away yeah. is being introduced in the middle of a political economy that's um, highly unjust 
-hmm. um, you have more and more billionaires all the time who have so much money they don't even know what to do with it. So they try to go to Mars or whatever, mm -hmm. which whatever is a great project, but there's so much to do here on Earth, you know. And so there's we've got to learn to juggle. There's many things that need to happen at the same time mm -hmm. because as we take away fossil fuels that have been relatively cheap, the people who get impacted by that are the ones who have uh, who drive trucks and right. you know do things that. Um, you know, aren't the most glamorous jobs in the world and they're bar barely getting by. And mm -hmm. so we need to be able to address the justice question, the economic justice question at the same time that we transition to renewable technologies. Um, Microsoft is starting to invest in nuclear power in order to run these server farms because AI is, uh, takes a lot of compute power. Yeah. And if fossil fuel is going away, uh, coal is going away, you need these they're talking about mini reactors and, you know, um, it seems likely to me that to maintain the level of technological infrastructure and convenience that we're used to, wind and solar are not actually going to do it. And I'm not pro-nuclear, but I also just think we need to get real about the level of sacrifice that would be required for us to actually transition away from fossil fuels and to do so fast enough to still have the infrastructure in place and to not have... Um, millions of refugees, climate refugees, that will start wars. I mean, things can spiral very quickly. It's not just a natural um, disaster mm -hmm. that we're facing because it has knock-on effects in how human beings fail to get along, you know? And I do have hope that these technologies will act as a mirror to remind us mm. of our own humanity because there is a tremendous really opportunity. Yeah. As we can automate things, we have so much wealth. We have so much capacity to feed and clothe and house and educate people. But our priorities are all messed up because we don't really reflect on what it is to be a human being and what we're supposed to be doing here. And that mirror that can be provided by these machines, you know, if we do train a language model with the best of humanity, it can reflect back to us and remind us, you know, who and what we are and what we could really be doing on this, this beautiful garden of a planet. Mm -hmm. And so I have some hope, but there's so many challenges and we really do need to do multiple things at once. It's a technical challenge. It's an ethical challenge. Um, and nature will not be cooperating from here on out. No, she's prodding us. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wonder in that regard about the uh, mirror image, which you, raise as well. Um, who should be embarrassed about that Apollo 11? <laughs> uh, the, the people who made a non-diverse team to begin with, that is us, at a certain time in our life, or uh, the computer, which was reflecting our best values back to us. I, I think it's probably, probably the earlier period. That's certainly something I don't have an answer to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, again, uh, to turn to you, Zan, uh, your frontier that you moved to long before even, but you've concentrated more on art. Um, art is leading us, and I wonder, I, I just want to give you an opening to, to talk about art in this particular sphere uh, and how you see it helping. You, you've indicated that it, uh, as a multi-point narrative that allows us to explore with some freedom and play that we learn more that way, um, that we expand our own sense of what's possible. Uh, but what else would you say about the role of art in, um, in this AI question? Well, I'm, I'm taking a very broad view when, when I speak of storytelling. Yes. In other words, storytelling is everything from the memoir and the fact that the, the child who is on location picking up his cell phone and reporting a, a fire is, is the expert for that situation. In other words, he's in the right place at the right time. And I think the really powerful example of that is Darnell Fraser, who um, there was only one person out of the whole crowd that was standing around observing the murder of George Floyd. And that was a high school girl who picked up her cell phone 
and for more than 10 minutes filmed that entire event, Darnell Fraser, a black girl. And um, she then testified in the trial and literally, I would say, changed the world by bearing witness. In other words, she was the expert yes. by being in that place at that time and having the courage to say, I'm going to film this thing and I'm going to stand here and film the whole thing, which is more than 10 minutes. And there was a guy standing next to her holding a cell phone. He wasn't filming anything. Nobody else filmed that event, right? And she wasn't told to do anything. And so I think the, the, the power in this, this idea of storytelling is we can all bear witness to what we see, what we know, what we experience, what we understand. And then we can start to look critically. We have different opinions and different ways of looking at the world. But until we can get those many views on the table, we just have a single, you know, this is the information and this is misinformation, this kind of polarized view. I would like to throw one other thing into the hopper here, which is the distinction between collective intelligence, which we talk about a lot, and collaborative intelligence, which I think has the real potential to address our great problems. So collective intelligence really fits into the consensus model of problem solving. So the, the, there's a large pool, there's a single broadcaster who broadcasts a question to a large number of anonymous responders who throw their responses into the hopper. This is then algorithmically processed to deliver, we hope, a better than average result, right? But that is the consensus result of, an, of a large number of anonymous responders who are homogenized. And so what is intriguing about collaborative intelligence is that that is really an evolutionary model mm -hmm. where the players are not anonymous. This is the, the, as in nature, and whether agents or, you know, whether AI agents or humans, mm -hmm. they have identities. Yes. And so we can start to look at who's doing what in, in the system. Mm -hmm. And I've just heard a recent, uh, quite interesting program on, I'm not sure whether it was KPFA or KQED now, but they were talking about the problem of anonymity on the internet and how we can get this kind of cancel culture, um, extreme views, because people can't, they can go at it anonymously. Whereas if they had to put their name down, then they have to take ownership of what they're saying. And I think that would be a very important change to um, at least start us toward looking at what we're doing a little better. And, you know, I love that. Um, in your, your reference earlier to cyberpunk, um, of course, William Gibson, one of the pioneers of that, one of his really compelling novels, there's a character um, who appears, this, this is you know 20 years ago, uh, on a screen as a flaming um, skull in the desert, and she's powerful, and uh, she, she gives her friends who are on this quest together, uh, Iduru is the novel, um, uh, courage with her great strength. And finally they, they meet her uh, and she's a, a, a very fragile, um, very limited physically uh, girl in Mexico City. And she's taken an identity. So, so what you have rightly pointed out is the we see the burgeoning problems of anonymity. For Gibson at that moment, it was the uh, freedom uh, for this, this character to be able to recreate herself and make herself something uh, that her physical condition would have belied. Um, you know, so it's interesting how something... Well, that's a very important point. Because part of the problem that we have, and this is more than, broader than just AI, is the constant tracking right? So that you cannot reinvent yourself. Like what, you, what you did 20 years yeah. ago, if you suddenly want to switch careers, you know, that's on the books. And, okay. and, and I, I really do think we need the freedom to be able to be who Re we are and yeah. say what we, yeah. right? It's a, 
And, so. and uh, um, I remember Buckminster Fuller's wonderful quote where he said, I don't mind if I'm contradicting myself. I'm learning all the time. And, yes. you know, if you look at the, the work of any great thinker, you often see that they've really changed their views at some point, right? Emerson agreed with, with Fuller. He said that as well about contradicting himself. It was a good thing. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think we have reached the point. I, I'm sure you're, like, full of questions and so stimulated by these amazing people, and I, I do mean that. I've... I've um, I feel so much energy from these three. Um, I think our great Rebecca Nessel is going to, uh, has a microphone here. And uh, we have about a half an hour for some questions. And the hands are popping up on this side, nobody on this side, what's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, I have a fear to share. Okay. And it sits right on the border between probability and likelihood. One of the things that we can get from artificial intelligence, from LLMs, is the likelihood that something is the next word. You know, that's one of the things that LLMs tell us. One of the things we can get from artificial intelligence is the likelihood that this event will occur, mm -hmm. the likelihood that this person will do this thing based upon the information that we've collected through that GM application as it impacts their insurance rates. Um, if you take that the next step into law enforcement, yeah. the likelihood that someone mm -hmm. is going to or not commit a crime I'm really concerned about how to think about, like, how to usefully use the information that comes that this event is likely to occur. And where do we, where do we kind of draw a line on saying, but we don't know if it's occurred. Mm -hmm. We don't know that this person has done this thing. We know they're likely to have. Where do we draw that? line. I'm really concerned about how everything we're building here can be used and misused, especially in a law enforcement sense. Hmm. It's an excellent question. Uh, I, I think one answer is in a book called um, You Matter More Than You Think uh, by Karen O'Brien, who's a sociologist, uh, uh, lives and teaches in Oslo. I think she's an American. And she argues that we, though we know better, that we live in a Newtonian, we act as if it's a Newtonian world when it's a quantum world. And one of the outcomes of that is inevitability. Uh, that, that if you, the likelihood is so high that this will happen. And that that limits us in our ability to believe that we can turn back climate change, uh, that, we can, that we can do many of the things that we hope we can do rather a, an idea of indeterminacy uh, would, ha would serve us better. But that's just uh, uh, you know, a quick response from me. Um, wh what would you all say? I mean, the clearest example of this, and you, you probably were referencing this, uh, was, uh, is, the fact, is the use of machine learning uh, uh, in the uh, sentencing guidelines uh, and decisions around parole and the like, which study after study has shown as they've been deployed have ended up uh, uh, having unfair biases based on skin color, having unfair outcomes and inscrutable outcomes too. The algorithm told me this person uh, should be put away for 20, 15 to 20, right? Um, but where did that come from? And even, you know, a lot of science, AI researchers will tell you the math just resulted in that. We can't mm. pin a, 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 a like culpability for that or give a clear answer why. It's just the sum of this information made that suggestion, right? Uh, which is washing themselves of their responsibility mm -hmm. to actually adjudicate that as humans, right? And that's a, that's a real risk is when, uh, to back to your introduction, you know, when we have allowed these augmentations to become substitutions, right, uh, uh, to, to, to remove some of our agency over and accountability for these responses. And so a key part
part I, uh, of the, of the I, I think of the moral obligation when you deploy these is to not remove the human accountability from it. When right. you see a self-driving car, you know, almost hit a pedestrian, that's not because, oh, there was a software bug and what can you do about that? No, it's the company that deployed that. It's, yes. the, it's the individuals at that company who uh, have a connection to, to the culpability for that, right? Mm -hmm. It might still be that for society, it's better to have the machines drive the cars than the humans, right? You know, at the end of the day. Um, but, uh, but as a risk management thing, we've got to make sure we don't allow these tools to become a way of washing out the, the, the human accountability in, in the deployment of these systems. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Matt, did you? Can I? Yeah, just, Please. I think, just briefly, I, I worry that we would, like you, that we might become so enamored and impressed by the capabilities of these machines that we forget the basic responsibility we have to uphold personhood and the ethics of personal relationship. I mean, in a relationship with a loved one or a close friend, you know, sometimes we catch ourselves assuming we know how that person's gonna behave or we have a whole story about them and we think it's about them, but really that's us not treating them like a person, right? Um, and so, again, it's throwing us back on ourselves and holding up a mirror and saying, can we be ethical people and take responsibility and not get so um, impressed by what these machines, what we think they can do, that we amputate our own capacities for making moral judgments, uh, whether we're judges or, or anything else. So again, it's raising the stakes of our, our sense of what it means to be a person. Okay, I guess it's me. Yes. Um, so I just wanna say quickly, as a person of color, as a black woman, I know people who work for Waymo and a lot of them are black people, so don't worry. Some of us are in the room. Um, but I use AI all the time. And I think to what a lot of you are saying is when the AI I'm using is incorrect, I'm gentle and I correct it. I say, oh, hey, I'm not going to give any ads for any of the ones I use, but oh, hey, Susan, I'm going to use that. That's not the name of an AI platform that I know of, but it's the name I'm going to give it Susan now. GPT. You know, hey, Susan, actually, X, Y, Z. And what I find is they do. They're learning as they go. So I would just say this is more of a testimony. Don't be scared of these platforms, use them and teach them and contribute to them. We all have a part in this. So being scared of it, I don't think really serves anyone's purpose. But um, so yeah, just, you know, positive points, they help people work better. Like was it 80 something percent of people who use AI in a conjunction with their work, work better, right? You know, now, okay, let's define better, but you know, I'm just here giving some a positive take. I'm I'm mostly a Pollyanna on most of this stuff. Yeah. And you know, it's not just Chip and Becky at some tech company working on this stuff. There are people that look like me that are in those buildings too. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Hi. Thank you all for coming. This is a great conversation. Um this is a consciousness question, so I guess it's mainly for Matt, since he is the expert on consciousness, but it could be for all of you. Um, it's... I hope we're all experts on consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it seems that, you know, in the last 16 years, since we were all, you know, colonized by the alien life form, right, there has been a kind of a collapse of interiority, that is, the ability of people to just have the confidence of their own perceptions, of their own sensibilities, of their own meaning-making um, uh, uh, apparatus to just be, to, to operate out of themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'll just stipulate that. I'll assume everybody agrees with me. <laughs> and it seems that, you know, AI um, will accelerate this, but, you know, I, I have hope that, you know, that in some magical Marshall McLuhan way that, that, you know, you hit a limit and we bounce back and we re into a reversal and somehow technology actually increases our ability to have interiority. I don't know how that would happen, but I would love to believe it would. And I wonder if you have any thoughts as to how that might actually occur. 
Hmm. Well, I think I, I agree with you. There is this threat of the loss of interiority, the loss of attention, um, the capacity to sit down and read a book without being distracted, just even by the desire to Google something. Um, I sometimes find, um, even with just the very ancient technology of writing, that when I, I'm in the midst of reading and, and trying to absorb new ideas, that something occurs to me and I want to go write it down. And so there's already a sense in which you know, we've been colonized, as you put it, um, by the alphabet. And, and our consciousness has been totally transformed by that. And now we have this new iteration of tools that's continuing to transform our consciousness. And whatever consciousness is, um, it's not some kind of fixed essence that just exists as it has always existed. It's constantly being changed by every little decision that we do, by everything that we eat. It's, it's malleable. It's something that's always in the making. And I think these new tools do, there are many paths we could go down, um, but we're always gonna be in this process of creating ourselves and recreating ourselves in relationship to these externalizations of mind. And I'm, I'm, not, as, I'm not just fearful, I'm actually kind of excited by these tools. Um, I use them too, and I find them to be, they can be a boon to creativity. Um, they can help me um, you know, remember roughly in some book you know, where something was said that I can't quite remember the page, you know, just as an example as a scholar. Um, but you know, we, have to, we have to be careful with our own consciousness because it's not something that um, remains unchanged by our practices and the ways that we engage with our tools. We're, we're very, uh, we're always in the making. And I think we need to take better care of our consciousness, as it were. Hmm. Bishop, can I add to that? Uh, the, uh, yeah, there, please, please. Two, 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 I'm sorry. Is that okay? Uh, two things that come to mind. So in the early 90s, as we were starting to wire ourselves together into this internet, one of the things that I think was an expansion of human consciousness was the ability to have not just conversations with anybody around the world at zero cost, essentially, compared to sending a letter or having a long distance phone call, but to be able to have confidential conversations. Um, mm -hmm. The debate around AI is very much an echo of, uh, or, or a sequel to the debate around the end-to-end uh, -end encryption, the ability that you and I should be able to send messages that not even a nation state can read. Uh, uh, and I remember sending PGP messages with individuals in the Soviet Union during the Russian coup in the uh, uh, early, uh, late 91, right, as a college student at Berkeley going, I, uh, this is amazing, I can, I can get source information from people in a, in, a, in a state where they would not be comfortable saying these things over an open phone line or an open bulletin board, right? That expansion of consciousness, something we might take for granted today, but there continues to be debates over the rights of humans to be able to communicate confidentially, uh, uh, even if there's bad information we're sharing uh, person to person, right? Um, and, and I think in other ways, technologies have helped us expand our sense of consciousness, our sense of humanity uh, beyond these walls. So I'll, I'll end there in the interest of time. Oh, that's great. I also, I appreciated uh, your reference to Marshall McLuhan. <laughs> um, he said at one point, and it's really stuck with me, that there are moments in culture where the background becomes the foreground. And those are the moments when we can learn uh, more about ourselves than any other moment. When that which is taken to be taken for granted suddenly is in front of us and it's no longer assumed. And the mirroring, which all three of the panelists have, have spoken about it in one way or the other, could do that. The AI mirroring could show us what we assume to be the background reality. And so, so it could be one of those moments and interiority could be increased. Um, rather than collapsed uh, by, by the thoughtful use of AI in that regard. Hello, um, I'm Parham. Um, there's a confusion for me. I have an interesting life. Uh, for the first half of my life, I was a computer engineer, software programming, you know. And when I had conversations with my coworkers and everybody, they're like, 
all foresee this future that there's this AI comes and there's a higher intelligence that's going to make us obsolete. They're not going to need us anymore. We're going to be dead or killed or whatever, right? That's one side of the pictures. Mm -hmm. And then um, after a while, I went through a something and I became a, a minister of psychedelics. You know, I started working with people in expanded states. And people, when they go into those spots, they talk about this higher intelligence that exists. That's mm -hmm. a collective intelligence of all of us. And it arouses and it shows through different modalities, different tools for humanity. And this higher intelligence supposedly is the one that comes back and heals them, helps them, helps everybody, is going to heal our humanity, right? So I'm confused because based on this experience that I have recently, the utopia, the future that I see is this higher intelligence using AI or becoming this AI built being mm -hmm. is going to come look at us as the necessary building blocks of life, you know, and we're going to be humans. We're going to be just another species on this planet that is going to be cared for, right? Hey, humans need these things. They need pens to draw arts. They need these things. They mm -hmm. need to do that. Um, and AI intelligence is going to give us the tools to make us be at our best, just like the AI intelligence is going to do the same thing to pandas in the zoo that we're doing right now, trying to keep them alive, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the disconnect is when you go out in the ordinary, it feels like people don't see a future that's good. You know, everybody's like, yeah, we're all going to die. It's not going to be good. <laughs> I'm confused. Like, what, where is that pain? Where does that come from? Do you have mm -hmm. any comments to help well, me understand it better? I would like to ask Zan to respond to this, but partly, um, because I believe one of your uh, subjects of real interest and in study has been at Teilhard. Teilhard de Chardin. Yeah, um, and and the idea of the noosphere and uh, you know a, coll a collaborative higher intelligence. I I just think you probably got the answer he's looking well, for. Uh, so both, but <laughs> Mr. Fuller with the world game and yeah. Teilhard de Chardin with the idea of the noosphere and then many, many others who've talked about the global brain. This is yeah. a, a big idea that's, that's out there. But I want to throw something else into the hopper, which I think relates to what you said. And because nobody said anything about capitalism and big consolidation and power and so forth, right? Or Matthew maybe? started to... I said has, political he has, economy. Well, he I, has I, strong I, opinions I, about and it. And I think this fits the great <laughs> cathedral I. <laughs> because uh, Adam Smith, who is known for The Wealth of Nations, which was published in 1776, perfectly timed to coincide with the American Revolution, became a massive bestseller, which is considered the justification for capitalism. Adam Smith was a very quiet, academic guy who had written another book prior to The Wealth of Nations. And I believe that, that well, I, indeed, he intended that these two books be read together. And his first book, which was published in 1759, exactly a century before Darwin published Origin of Species, mm. was entitled Theory of Moral Sentiments. And it was about ethics. And the assumption of Adam Smith was that these two books were a pair that should be read together and implemented together. Well, Fantastic. it is our interpretation that picked up only the wealth of nations and forgot the theory of moral sentiments, forgot wow. that there needed to be ethics yeah. in, in how we implemented all of these things. And the same thing, really, happened with Darwin and Darwinism, I think with his full agreement, because he was very worried about the opposition of the church, the opposition, you know, lots of possible sources of opposition. And so he went along with the connection of Darwinism. Herbert Spencer became his big promoter. And this was, you know, the survival of the fittest is Darwinism, right? And again, he did, uh, David Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie loved Darwinism, loved Herbert Spencer's intro. And, and Herbert Spencer was an editor with The Economist. So he was, you know, very 
interested in the capitalistic view. And so what has happened is we have misinterpreted, because I'm, I'm very interested in getting evolution right if we're going to get collaborative intelligence right. And if we're going to value what each of us as a conscious, uh, hopefully ethical thinker can contribute, we need to look at the, well, how we have personified corporations, for example, and how we have huge, the idealism behind capitalism, we have lost track of that uh, because now the, the corporations are empowered and the individuals are far less empowered. And I think that's a Grace Cathedral uh, issue. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Microphone. Oh, I'm sorry, Rebecca. We'll take two more. So this one and, and the one you were at. I apologize. I'll keep it as, as absolutely brief as I can. There's a uh, really extraordinary poem by Robert Frost called The Mower. And there was a reference to reverence with cutting grass. And I really encourage everyone to, I'm not going to recite it because I don't want to use all the time. But in one of the elements of the poem, and he talks about the farmer who knows not what the scythe whispers and that tools do things that the farmer does not understand. <laughs> it's a very, very powerful poem. Mm -hmm. um, there's a quote, a famous quote, um, the neuron is a hedonist. And that's driving a lot of our interaction with technology. There's a very well-known economist named Blanche Flower, and I encourage everyone to read his work. And he explores the current economy we have, which is different than the economy we've ever had. Our economy features gambling, pornography, very, very base things. And this was mentioned earlier about how to feed AI mm. the best of us. Right. Um, I encourage everyone to read his, his work. Um, <laughs> um, my question is mirroring. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what does AI tell us about ourselves? And that was mentioned a little earlier. Maybe Matthew could speak to that. And uh, because it's a very, very difficult tension between what we like to think about ourselves and that mirroring question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Sorry you. if I took too long. No, no, it's a good question, and I'm actually going to borrow one of Adam Smith's ideas, lesser known ideas about fellow feeling and sympathetic imagination. You know, consciousness is not just something that's merely individual. Like, I have my own private little inner you know, world, and you have your own private little inner world. We become conscious together. It, the word literally means knowing together, <laughs> consciousness. And so, you know, we come into this world, we're cared for, hopefully, by loving parents, and it's the mirroring of mother and father that teach us who we are. And interiority, to the extent that we develop it, is something like a gift from those loving relationships that welcome us into the world if we're, you know, lucky enough to have that. And so when I think about what machines can teach us, you know, I think that there's this term in occultism called egregore. It's this idea that human intention, when projected onto, uh, it could be something like a brand or it could be an AI system. It, that human intention, uh, when a lot of people collectively give energy to, to, a, to an entity, it becomes in some sense autonomous. If that human intention is taken away, it, it dissolves. It's not actually an independent demon, right, that has power over us. To the, it's only the power we give it over us. And so when we think about mirroring and the power of human intention, we create each other with our intention, with our love, but we can create demons with our fear just as easily, right? And so when we think about the power of our intention, um, we are creating AI and it is creating us and we're entering into this process of, of mutual evocation. So what are we evoking? Neurons are also very, uh, all about fellow feeling. Yeah, right? And that's such an important part of Adam Smith's 
ethical teaching that does get lost. Hi, thank you so much for taking one last question. So I want to go back to some of what I think of, two of what I think of as the more immediate harms of AI that we've touched on. One is surveillance capitalism, as in the GM app example. Um, and the antidote to that could be privacy, which is very important for EFF, thank you. Um, and then another problem is deep fakes, eroding, er eroding trust, eroding our uh, sense of reality and shared reality. And perhaps the, the antidote to that is trust. And so privacy, trust, anonymity, I'm wondering how you all see these things uh, in tension together or working together to address these near-term harms. Thank you. These are certainly echoes of the kinds of debates and, and, and struggles we've had over the 30 years in the technology domain. It's just they get much sharper because it feels like we're further along on this asymptotic curve of the, the kind of power that both individuals can have and companies can have to, to do harm, right? And, and we're not quite sure yet whether we also have the, the same kind of you know, uh, growth in our ability to prevent those harms. Um, I remain an optimist in this domain. Uh, I feel like the public cares quite a bit more about privacy than they have before whether it's the GDPR, and which you, I think will see emerge as a call for similar privacy laws in the United States. Uh, you see companies start to differentiate on privacy. It was rewarding even to see Apple start to, to, to say, we're, we want to be careful about the apps in the App Store because we want to make sure that they're being honest when they talk about their privacy policies and that sort of thing. Uh, I, I, so so give, I'll give due credit across, across that whole spectrum. But I do believe that when we talk about the potential for AI harms, we are using that as a proxy to talk about these uh, uh, struggles we've had historically. Um, and I, I, countering AI harms isn't just about trying to put guardrails in the LLMs. It is about trying to find new ways, new tools for consumers to express agency over the technologies that they're using. Um, one of the other projects at the Linux Foundation I work on is the, the Open Wallet Foundation, which is about trying to take a new approach to things like digital driver's licenses, digital uh, uh, diplomas, digital credentials uh, that put you at the center of deciding when those get shared in a way they prove, yes, you really did graduate from this school. Even if the school's website is down because they went out of business 10 years ago, you can prove that that's a valid thing and to somebody who can verify the integrity of that, right? So um, just a small part of the fight, uh, of course, but uh, I think you will see technologists pivot towards uh, working on those kinds of, even more so working on those technologies and the public expecting a baseline, or a, a, a higher baseline than they've had before around the trust and in the, in the sense of safety they have when using a tool. Thank you. Thank you. I am so grateful to our panelists and to Grace Cathedral, everyone, for making this possible, and for you for attending. I hope that this is a beginning. Uh, that we could expand the circle of people in this conversation as you have expanded it this evening and um, let us know uh, what would be useful to you, uh, how this conversation could um, increase and include um, your thoughts. Again, thank you. <laughs>